Welcome to the Lancaster Patriot Podcast. My name is Chris Hume, and I am the managing editor at the Lancaster Patriot, a conservative print newspaper serving Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Well, today on the podcast, I have two stories from Lancaster County, and we'll spend most of our time on the first one. Now, this first story comes from LMP, and I don't often mention LMP, and I don't often use their stories on the podcast, but I just had to in this case, uh, and this is an important issue to consider. So the story says, the title of the story, the headline is, Pride Flags Reported Stolen, Chalk Messages Found Outside Gay-Owned Lancaster City Business and Home. And I think the biggest part of the story, perhaps one of the biggest parts, and the first thing to say is about the editor's note at the beginning of the article. And it says this, it says, Editor's Note, the article below has been updated to comply with recommendations from the Associated Press Style Guide and the LGBTQ Advocacy Organization, GLAAD, or GLAD. Both advise against using the term homosexuals to refer to gay people, as the word has been co-opted by some as a slur, end quote. So folks, our culture and many within our county here in Lancaster County are working hard to normalize sin, in this case, the sin of homosexuality. First and foremost, homosexuality, and I will keep saying that, I will keep calling it homosexuality, especially since the politically correct people want to remove that from our vocabulary, but homosexuality is a sin. It's a sin that God judges. It's a sin that destroys individuals, it destroys families, and it destroys societies. And the loving thing to do is to oppose it. Loving righteousness demands the hating of wickedness. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, speaking of Jesus to all those who will say, well, you're not being very Christ-like in calling homosexuality a sin. You're not being very Christ-like in, in speaking about hate. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, speaking of Jesus, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. If you love life, if you love truth, if you love beauty, if you love the family, if you love righteousness, you have to hate death and lies and perversion and the destruction of the family. At any rate, the word gay has a historical cultural meaning prior to the homo movement that should be retained. Gay means merry, airy, jovial. It denotes more life and animation than cheerful, Noah Webster said. Basically the opposite of homosexual, homosexuals. Uh, they are anything but cheerful. As a group, they are miserable people. Now they put on an, uh, an outward appearance of this happiness, but they are miserable, bitter people uh, ultimately at their root because they are in rebellion against God's design for humanity in rebellion against it. So no, homosexual is a better term to describe this sin, and that is what we should continue to use, and we should not allow the word gay to be uh, co-opted. It speaks of co-opting the word homosexual. No, the only co-opting, if, if you want to call it that, I guess, has been the homosexuals using the word gay uh, that has a, a good meaning in history. So not only in this story then, I mean, at least in the editor's note, we haven't even gotten to the story. We have here the linguistic attempt to normalize sin, but in the article itself, the writer, who it's Dan Neffen, says this. He says, quote, Ballard, who uses the pronoun they and gay, their fiancé, said they felt targeted. And I don't know if this is coincidence or what, but yeah, one of the people in the story, the last name is gay, but... So it says Ballard, who uses the pronoun they. Now, even after hearing this, at this point, sadly, so many times, it still baffles me. How in the world are we going to use the pronoun they to refer to one person and then expect to have coherent language and communication? How can we even discuss things if we can't even use pronouns correctly? This is the fruit of sin. This is the fruit of chaos. It's Christ or chaos. And, and how do you even use language when you abandon God's created order and the, the use of pronouns, language itself? Okay, so the story. The story is about someone allegedly stealing a pride flag from the porch of these homosexuals. Now, I do not condone theft. 
right? God's law says you shall not steal. Theft is wrong. People should not steal their neighbor's property. But there's something bigger to the story that I want to address. Now, of course, if this was a Philadelphia Eagles flag that was stolen from someone's porch, I can guarantee you the LNP would not have written a story on it. And it's probably likely that that flag would not have been stolen. Perhaps it would have, though. Perhaps there's some Dallas Cowboys fans or something like that. But the point is this. What is it about the pride flag that makes this something we should consider? The pride flag is a representation of abomination and rebellion against God. It represents our culture's most ardent and outspoken opposition to the biblical worldview and the created order. It stands as a symbol for perversion, destruction, and death. And then it is no surprise that this flag, this symbol, this idol, if you will, often accompanies the movement to slaughter babies via abortion. Go to a, an abortion rally and you'll likely see this flag. Now, biblically, as I mentioned, homosexuality is a destructive, destructive sin. Leviticus 20, verse 13, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Again, this is sin, the sin that leads to destruction. Now, in a righteous society, in a righteous society, in a righteous county, if Lancaster County would again be a righteous county and even go beyond what it was in the past, we don't simply want to go back. We want to learn and move forward and be even more godly, more righteous than our forefathers were. By the grace of God, that's the only way that can happen. But in a righteous society, I do not think that it would be a stretch to say that such things as, as, a, as a homo pride flag would fall under the general category of blasphemy or profane speaking laws. In fact, in Pennsylvania history, they were known as corrupt communications laws. In fact, in the 1600s in Pennsylvania, all right, this is Pennsylvania founded by William Penn. The law said this, Quote, that whosoever shall speak loosely and profanely of Almighty God, Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, or the scriptures of truth, and is legally convicted thereof, shall for every such offense pay five shillings or suffer five days imprisonment in the house of correction at hard labor for the behoof or advantage of the public and be fed with bread and water only during that time, end quote. Now, those sorts of laws, and there are many of them in Pennsylvania history and throughout the nation and even the world and other nations that were founded upon or at least greatly influenced by biblical truth, those sorts of laws were built upon a biblical worldview. And for all those who say, well, religious tolerance in Pennsylvania history uh, mean, meant that people could do and say whatever they wanted, those people simply don't know their history. William Penn would not have supported a homosexual pride flag if it were around at the time because he was certainly opposed to homosexuality. He was opposed to speaking blasphemous things against God. He would have been opposed to this. Furthermore, if we want a righteous society, there are certain things that will be outlawed. This is why you will not hear me refer to the concept of free speech as a principle that can stand on its own right. Freedom of speech falls under the freedom provided in God's law. Not the, the idea of free speech does not mean that a righteous society would countenance treasonous speech against the Lord of the nation, namely Christ. So the idea that, well, it's, it's religious freedom and tolerance, that, that, and that means just anything goes, that's not how it would be in a righteous biblical society. It's not how the founders wanted the state. It's not how William Penn wanted the state to be. Well, the story goes on to note that chalk messages were written, and the story says this. It says, quote, a gay-owned, and I'll just say homosexual-owned, but the story says a gay-owned downtown business had the word groomers written in chalk on the sidewalk outside its en entrance, while over in the city's northwest, someone wrote groomer on the sidewalk of a home with a pride flag. The article continues, it says, Groomer is taken from grooming behavior an adult engages in toward a child to gain their trust so the adult can sexually abuse the child. It has been adopted by opponents of equal rights for gay people. Those opponents believe gay people want to indoctrinate their children, end quote. Okay, so that's, that's the story. 
couple points on that. What does it mean to oppose, quote, equal rights for gay people? That's the rhetoric uh, of the article, saying that people who use this term groomer are, are opponents of equal rights for gay people. Now, this has nothing to do with equal rights. First of all, uh, equal rights is, is kind of a, a, a fantasy thing when it's applied to this realm. For, the idea is this, or the truth is this, I should say. Everyone does not have an equal right to everything. We do not all have equal rights. For example, I do not have the right to marry a woman right now. I do not have that right because I am already married. Now, my neighbor, if I have a single male neighbor, he would have the right to marry a woman right now. I do not have that right. I do not have equal rights with my neighbor. And for me to demand that would be sinful and wicked. I do not have the right to marry if it were even possible to use the right, the, the good concept of marriage in the context of, of this. I, I do not have the right to marry an animal, whether I was single or not. I don't have that right. And in a similar fashion, men do not have the right to marry men, whether they are homosexual or otherwise. Women do not have the right to marry women. It is not a right that anyone has to do that. This is not a matter of equal rights. It is a matter of subverting God's good and gracious design and his good and gracious law. You see, we do not all have equal rights and we should not want equal rights because that would be a ridiculous society. Now, if we talk about human rights, again, this said, oh, well, we want tra human rights for trans or gay people again this is a category error any any person as a human being has certain rights but we do not all have equal rights again i don't have the right to marry a woman right now because i am already married really with this they want they want more rights uh more rights and and i don't we shouldn't even call them rights it's just they want their sin to be celebrated and recognized in the society and yes i will say that anyone who teaches children that it is acceptable to practice homosexuality is sexually abusing children in some form or fashion. And uh, they are unfit to instruct anyone, let alone young kids. Now, I don't know whether the people in the story uh, were doing that. I don't know, and I'm not saying they are. But I do know that they are openly flaunting their sin for the whole community to see. And they're openly flaunting uh, their rebellion and their sin and their wickedness. Now, do I think the the groomer message uh, in chalk on the sidewalk is the best approach? Probably not. No, I probably don't think that's the best approach. But the story does note that no laws were broken in writing the message in chalk and no charges will be filed related to the chalk messages. And even if I do not agree with the chalk message method, the pride flag itself is far far, far, far more offensive. I mean, not even close than the chalk message. Far more offensive. Now, some people will say, well, this you're so unloving. How could you be opposed to homosexuals in the county or in general? Uh, what an unloving uh, episode for you to, to speak this way. Listen, I already mentioned that if we are going to love the good, we have to hate the evil whether that's in the form of homosexuality, whether that's in the form of heterosexual sin, whether that's abortion, whether that's theft, whatever it is, we have to call it what it is. Here's what we need to understand as it relates to this idea of the charge that this is unloving. The biblical worldview calls us to love our neighbor. But the Bible explains, of course, what that means. Jesus said the law and the prophets depend on this, love God and love neighbor. The Apostle Paul said all the laws summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself. And people will say, see, there you go, Chris, just you're not loving your neighbor. That's what the Bible says. What people fail to understand, of course, is they, they pull scripture out of context. What they fail to understand is that these th this means that the law teaches us how to love neighbor. The point of this is the law teaches us how we are to love God and love neighbor. When the Apostle Paul says the law is summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself, he does not mean that, hey, you can ignore all the commands in Scripture and you can look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to decide what it means to love my neighbor. And then by doing what I think is right, I'm following God's law. That's not what the Apostle Paul means. He means that all the commandments in Scripture, 
teach us how to love God and love neighbor. And so the command against homosexuality, the command against murder, in the case of abortion, the law shows me that I'm not loving my neighbor if I don't call out that sin, right? I, just like I'm not loving my neighbor if I commit adultery with his wife because the law tells me to not commit adultery. I can't say, well, I'm loving my neighbor by doing this because, uh, you know, I want to have this affair and his wife wants to have this affair and it's what we want and the loving thing is to let consenting adults do what they want. That's not the biblical standard. We love our neighbor by following God's law. Now, if my neighbor, so to speak, or someone in the, in the community is a homosexual atheist who keeps that sin and perversion private, then there's nothing more that needs to be said publicly about it. I would lovingly call him to repent of sin in general and trust in Christ just as, as I would anyone else. But the issue at hand with pride flags and so-called equal rights, quote-unquote, for homosexuals is another matter. It is the matter of idolatry and sin being allowed to prosper publicly in the county, in society. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 3, You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. This was the command God gave to his people. And they were entering into a pagan and idolatrous land. Now, the general equity of this command, we are not entering the land of Canaan. We do not have the conquest charge. But the general equity of this command is that a righteous people will not countenance evil and idolatry in their community. A righteous society will not countenance evil, will not countenance the homosexual pride flag. In a righteous society, in a righteous society all pride flags, all homosexual pride flags or any other sin pride flag would be destroyed just as the pagan idols would be disposed of. The pride flag represents the idolatrous, wicked, and destructive pagan religion of our day. Now that day when the pride flag and other idolatrous emblems are removed will only come when the people are so moved with the love for God and love for neighbor and love for the word that they will want to cleanse the land of evil. That would be the loving thing to do, again, to cleanse the land of evil and to prevent people from being exposed, especially young people, to this perversion is the loving thing to do. But as it stands now, it seems there are many, and I know there are some in the county who certainly oppose this, but there are many who want to countenance this idolatry, this wickedness, and it encourages more people, especially young people, to embrace sin, to the eternal destruction of their souls. Now, if we love our neighbors, we will want to keep this evil away from our communities and the young people in our community and the old people in our community, I mean, everyone. In a righteous society, this would not really be a matter of theft at this point because the pride flag would be recognized as an idolatrous pagan symbol that has no place in Christendom. And so the man would not have needed to steal it because the magistrate would have removed it already. That would have been what, happened, what would happen in a righteous society. May we return to a place like that in Lancaster County. Because it used to be that way. And again, I think we need to look at history, look at what they got right, what they got wrong. But there was a time when this would not have been tolerated in Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, in, in any of the states in America. And it is not because of some old ideal of, of just prudishness or something like that. It's because of the righteous standard of God's word. You know, prior to the gospel coming, there was great wickedness here. Just like in every culture uh, before the gospel arrives, there's great wickedness. And, and it's the law word of God that causes people to want to hate evil and love the good. So that's our first story. Yes, this man stole the, the pride flag, and, and sure, let's have him make restitution on that $20 flag, return the flag, pay it back, give them restitution for it. But let's get to the place then where this doesn't even need to be an issue, because if we have a righteous society, we would not tolerate, tolerate a symbol 
of perversion and abomination such as the pride flag. That would be what would happen in a righteous society. Well, now our second story, and this one's going to be brief because this is worthy of a full episode. So let me just comment on this. And it, it is similar, at least in, in some themes to the first one. But the second story is that Planned Parenthood is yet again attempting to come to Lancaster County. And this is from OneUnitedLancaster.com from May 6th. And it says this, let me read this. Planned Parenthood doesn't have a physical presence in Lancaster County, but that could change in the near future, a spokeswoman said Thursday. The organization is hoping to open a site in Lancaster sometime this year. Samantha Bobila, Chief External Affairs Officer for Planned Parenthood Keystone, told One United Lancaster. This is another example of a case where a righteous society would oppose the setting up of an altar of humanism and child sacrifice. Now, this is such an important issue in its own right that we will have to say more on it later, so stay tuned for more on that. But let me just say that if you want to see our county destroyed, if you want to see our society further devolve into chaos and death, this is the, the perfect way to do it. Stand by and let the butchery and idolatry of Planned Parenthood enter the county. That will be a sad, sad day if we allow that to happen. This needs to be opposed, just as the uh, proclamation and flaunting of homosexuality needs to be opposed by a righteous people. So too does this, because we love our neighbor. If we love our neighbor, we will not stand by and let babies be murdered in our county. So pray that this, uh, this scheme of the devil is thwarted and that righteousness will prevail. We, we need to not simply keep Planned Parenthood out of the county. We need to do much more to return the county to a biblical framework for righteousness and then move forward. That's going to be it for today. Until next time, God bless and Godspeed.